Patient Files of Dr. William Wickman, Director of Hillbrook Insane Asylum. Patient number 876, Jordan Page, nicknamed Porcelain Face by the orderlies and guards. Which I, by the way, do not approve of. Note to self, remember to reprimand the next staff member who refers to 876 as Porcelain Face. Patient 876 was unresponsive during our last session, as the one before that. The patient refrains from answering our questions or complying with our demands. Instead, just fiddling with her hair. Attempts at removing her mask, a porcelain mask painted in a tan flesh color, has proved unsuccessful. Last time we removed it, the patient became hysterical and extremely hostile. It appears best to let her keep it on, at least for the time being. Last time we removed it, the patient became hysterical and extremely hostile. It appears best to let her keep it on, at least for the time being. Off the record, it's simply astonishing how low 876 has fallen, compared to the absolutely charmed life she lived not too long ago. The life she and her sister shared. Twin sister. Jordan and Lee Page, famous glamour models. Their advantage over the other famous glamour models were that there were two of them. Mirror reflections of each other they were. Identical twins. No discernible differences between the two, unless they wanted to. Like for example Lee dyeing her hair, or Jordan cutting hers. Most of the time though they played up the mirror reflection, and that became their trademark. The most beautiful woman in the world, and two of her. The pair topped numerous crude lists of the so-called hottest celebrity women, or so I've been told. Anyway, for a time it seemed like the Page girls were going to conquer the world, figuratively speaking of course. Their own clothing brand, their own makeup brand, and even a movie deal in the works. Who knows how that endeavor would have turned out if the girls could act at all. That's something we never got to find out, as the accident then happened. It was a hot summer night, and the Page twins were attending a chic nightclub for the famous and the vain in downtown LA. This was one of the places celebrities came to go nuts, unwind, have a few drinks or ten, dance like fools, and gossip amongst themselves. It was also a great place to make new, influential friendships, especially if you were young and attractive. Jordan and Lee got particularly refreshed during this visit to the club and stayed for hours. They reportedly hung out in a special VIP room in the back, a room only used by the most distinguished among the distinguished. Actor Tom Cage, singer Julia Vega, and movie producer Chuck Goldstein were also present. A few other individuals topping the cream of the crop came and went too. Eventually, at about four in the morning, the sisters finally had enough and called it a night. Headed for the lavish LA mansion they called home, Jordan and Lee hopped into their bright red Porsche convertible, taking no consideration for their intoxications. After all, they'd driven while under the influence countless times in the past, and nothing had happened so far. Why would anything happen now? If only they knew, they probably would have called for a cab instead. Well, at least they had the sense to use their seat belts. However, sadly, they didn't have the sense to stay under 70 miles per hour. Instead, speeding up to 90. Lee was in the driver's seat, while Jordan was barely sitting up in the back seat. They played Julia Vega's latest hit on the radio while a cool wind blew through their hair. The sun was just about to peek up by the horizon, and the streets were mainly empty. Nothing could stop the two sisters. Lee recalls Jordan talking something about wanting another breast augmentation. Then Lee complained that she would have to get one too. After all, it wouldn't do if one had larger breasts than the other. That's the last Lee remembers before Jordan started screaming in the back seat. She had no idea what was going on until she suddenly saw a car right in front of her. <laughs> She only got a quick glimpse of it, lasting for less than a second. Then a massive jolt as the two cars became one, mangled parts of the red Porsche's front hood blending with the side doors of the other car. Lee's face was an inch away from smearing all across the steering wheel. The two vehicles stood still, embraced in a carnage, while a Porsche's horn blared like some doomsday alarm. Lee was barely conscious from the shock of impact, and struggled to lift her head. She could smell smoke and gasoline, and felt a warm sensation on her face. Suddenly, the door was torn open next to her, and hands started to pull at her. 
It was Jordan. She dragged her sister out of the wreckage, grabbing her by the armpits. Her, her legs like jelly, Lee's feet slid across the road, ruining the heels of her $5,000 pumps. With blurry eyes, she saw the two cars go up in flames. Jordan was swearing and screaming. They got about 20 feet away from the wreckage, or so Lee estimated, when it suddenly exploded into an inferno. <laughs> The two sisters were pushed back by the force of the explosion and flew several feet onto the hard concrete road. Lee had no idea how much time passed as she lay on the ground. Seconds? Minutes? Her ears were ringing from the explosion. And eventually she began to hear muffled sirens approaching. She struggled to get up and check on her sister. She found her lying just a couple of feet next to her. Jordan was squirming and twitching her body. Alive, thank God, but something was wrong. Lee, unable to fully stand up, pulled herself closer. Jordan was grabbing at her own face. Lee removed the hands, called out her name, and asked if she was okay. Then she saw that Jordan was certainly not okay. Her face, a charred mess. Her face had gotten caught in the blast, perhaps because she was standing up when the cars exploded, while Lee was being dragged low on the ground. Lee was too stunned and horrified to even let out a gasp. Her sister's face, her own face by all admission, a hideous carnage. She couldn't stand it. She had to look away. Lee sat there next to her squirming twin sister, holding her hands, until the ambulance finally arrived. Jordan naturally survived the ordeal, however, against all odds. Twice during that first night, she almost gave out, but miraculously pulled through in the end. What followed were six months in the hospital. The first three of those months were spent being nursed back to health and receiving skin grafts. The remaining three were spent on reconstructing an actual face for Jordan. Her old face, she would be given it back. Lee remained by her sister's side for most of this time, taking time off from work. Not that there were much work for her anyway, as people had come to expect two pages, double the beauty, not just the one. It was during these arduous months that Lee began to wonder about the future of the Page Twins' career. Were there any future at all left? At times, she felt the answer was a definite no, just by observing Jordan's slow recovery. It was a miracle she was even still alive, as so many doctors had said countless times. The finest plastic surgeon in all of LA worked on rebuilding Jordan's face. Peter Levine, or just Pete, as the pages called him, a friend of theirs. After three months, Levine's meticulous work was finally done. And Jordan Page, presumably resculptured underneath those bandages, got to go home at long last. Three weeks later, on a sunny December afternoon, Dr. Levine came a knocking at the door, complete with a nurse in tow. Jordan had not yet shed her bandages, but the time for the unveiling was at hand. By all intents and purposes, her face was all healed up now. The two sisters sat on a sofa in one of their mansion living rooms holding hands, as a doctor and his nurse hovered over them. With the nurse assisting, Levine began to unwrap Jordan's bandages. Slowly and gently, he took it. Lee was frightened out of her mind, scared of what might be revealed. <coughs> Would it be the old page face back again, perfect and all, or something else? Her fears went wild, and she imagined all kinds of images, each one worse than the previous. Lee did all she could to hide her fear, though, as holding her sister's hand, she could feel how Jordan was trembling. She was a lot more afraid. Lee had to keep that in mind and stay strong for her sister's sake. Despite being identical, it was her face, after all. Levine himself looked a bit nervous, but he tried to mask that with a warm, confident smile. Usually very sure of himself and his work, he knew that this time he hadn't much of a face to work with. He had basically been forced to rebuild Jordan's face from scratch, and that was not an easy task. Still, he had never failed before, and he prayed to the gods that this wouldn't be the first time. He carefully rolled away the bandages while they all waited with tense anticipation. Soon, some skin began to reveal itself, and some more. It looked fairly promising. Levine thought. Perhaps he'd worried in vain. Then, most of the bandages were off. Lee felt a rock sink down in her stomach. 
Levine pulled off the last bit of bandage and handed it over to the nurse. There, he proclaimed, trying to sound triumphant. It didn't look so bad. Not too bad at all, Levine. Levine told himself. It uh, could have been a lot worse. Lee nearly choked up on tears, but quickly pulled herself together. What does it look like? Jordan asked with a broken up voice. She could see their reactions, and tears began to swell up in her eyes. Something was wrong. Something was seriously wrong. What does it look like? She demanded this time. Now keep in mind that there was basically nothing left of your face, Jordan, Dr. Levine began. Anything is a vast improvement. You must remember this. You must keep in mind that Jordan cut him off and tried to gasp, but not a sound would come out. Instead, she just stared at that thing in the mirror with wide, horrified eyes, and it stared back at her. No, she whispered, and tears began to flow. Now a fury of sounds came out as she screamed in terror and despair. Lee still held her hand tightly, but couldn't think of anything to do or say to calm her twin down. What could one do or say to a person whose face was now a mockery of a visage? The face Jordan had seen in that mirror was a grotesque parody of the gorgeous Jordan Page. A mess of flesh, like some sick joke, like a child had played around with putty. Jordan's screams echoed throughout the entire mansion. And then, a crash, as she slammed the mirror out of Dr. Levine's hands, and it <coughs> fell against the floor. Jordan's head sunk down into her lap, and she covered herself up with her hands. Through the gap between her fingers, she could still see her reflection in the shards, however. Weeks passed, and Jordan isolated herself in the mansion, never going outside, despite the fact many of the sisters' friends called for her. Some of them, including the ones who were present in that VIP room on that fateful night, came knocking on the door. Jordan refused to see them, however, confining herself in her room. There was very little Lee could do. She simply told them her sister wasn't up for any visitors. Lee herself grew increasingly worried about Jordan's behavior. It was not good to isolate oneself. Jordan needed to leave the house, meet people, and start living her life again. She didn't even bother getting dressed any longer, simply walking around in her underwear in a see-through nightgown. But of course, Lee couldn't entirely blame her sister for her behavior. She wasn't quite sure how she herself would have reacted if it had happened to her. As such, she was understanding and refrained from pushing Jordan too much, merely suggesting once in a while that maybe the two of them went for a stroll in the neighborhood. This Jordan declined every time. Lee had to get out herself, though. She couldn't stand staying in that house with her distant sister. Not for too long, anyway. One evening, after a round of shopping with a couple of gal pals, Lee returned home and carefully entered Jordan's room. She had bought her a new dress and was going to show it to her. She found Jordan sitting in the corner of her room, in front of a mirror, slowly and repeatedly brushing her hair, like in some sort of dream state. Lee noticed in the reflection that her sister was wearing a mask, a special piece of art created by one of her artist friends. A porcelain mask painted in tan flesh colors, sculpted to look exactly like the Page Twins' face. They had two of them, one given to each of them as a gift from the artist. They had both been displayed on the wall of one of their living rooms. Apparently Jordan had removed the one, and now taking to wearing it over her face. Lee immediately felt a bit disturbed by this, but shrugged it off as Jordan simply wanted to look like herself once again, if only for a moment. She approached her twin and held up the dress, explaining it was for her. Jordan didn't respond and ignored Lee, continuing to brush her hair and stare into the mirror. Lee then began to talk about her day, the gals, and how they were doing. They were Jordan's friends too, after all. Lee didn't have any friends that she didn't share with her sister. She figured this might draw her back to the real world, and talked enthusiastically about how they had spent the day, the fancy boutiques they'd gone to, the cafe they'd dined at. None of this seemed to interest her sister, however. Suddenly, Jordan stopped brushing her hair. Looking into the mirror, Lee noticed that she was staring at her reflection now, staring with big, obsessive eyes. Lee went quiet. Jordan continued to peer at the face next to her in the mirror. That familiar face. The one she used to see in her own reflection. The one her mask was just a pale imitation of. Jordan. Lee whimpered. You have to snap out of this. Then Jordan swung her arm and violently struck the mirror with the brush. A giant crack formed in the glass, running right across Lee's reflection, splitting her face in half. Lee backed away, placed the dress on her sister's bed, and left her. This only got worse in the following days. Jordan continued to wear the porcelain mask, and as far as Lee knew, she never removed it, not even while sleeping. 
One night, Lee was awoken by a sudden sensation on her face. It felt as if hands were gently stroking her face. She sat up in bed with a jolt and with blurry eyes witnessed Jordan quickly exiting the room. She called out her name several times, but got no response. Her disturbed twin sister disappeared somewhere in the giant mansion. Lee made sure to lock her bedroom door after that. What little good that would make, as they both had keys for every single room in the house. At least she'd wake up from Jordan unlocking the door, or so she hoped. Lee spent the entire following weekend at a friend's place. She just had to get away from Jordan and her strange behavior. During this time away, she also came to the conclusion that a psychiatrist had to be brought to the house. Something had to be done about her sister's deteriorating state of mind. Lee returned to the mansion early that following Monday and found it oddly empty. The first thing she did as she entered the house was to call out Jordan's name. She got no answer, but that was to be expected. To make sure Jordan was actually there, Lee immediately went to her room, but no one was there. She searched throughout the entire place, including the gardens, but didn't find a single trace of her twin. The grand mansion stood airily empty, and Lee suddenly felt a shudder go down her spine. Considering Jordan's odd behavior as of late, not having a clue where she was at was a very scary notion. Where could she have gone? What could she be up to? The thought of her finally going out to enjoy herself, perhaps visiting friends, was a nice one. But somehow Lee knew that wasn't the case. Jordan was doing something she shouldn't be doing. But what and where? The thought of her going somewhere to commit suicide entered Lee's mind. She frantically began calling their various friends and co-workers, even estranged family members, asking if they had seen Jordan. It was to no avail, as no one had. Finally, Lee gave up and decided to just wait a while. Perhaps Jordan was up to something completely innocent. Maybe she had gone shopping or just strolling along the beach. It was best to give it a few hours, she figured. But if her sister hadn't returned by then, she would call the police. She made herself a drink, part grape juice, part vodka, but mostly vodka, and sat down by their pool outside. Two minutes later and the glass was empty, yet she didn't feel the least bit better. She found herself staring down at the water of the pool, looking at her own reflection, seeing her sister, like she used to be, sitting there on a lounger by the pool, just like she used to. Then, suddenly from out of nowhere, a second reflection appeared in the water, standing next to hers. A woman in a porcelain mask, wearing a see-through. Before Lee could turn around and face the woman, the sharp object was jammed into the side of her neck. It was a syringe. Lee could do nothing but watch as the syringe pressed some kind of colorful liquid into her neck. And moments later, she began to feel drowsy. Much drowsier than ten grape vodka drinks would make her feel. Her limbs then went numb, and soon she couldn't move at all. A few seconds later, the whole world went dark. The next thing she knew, she was beginning to regain consciousness. She couldn't see, but voices were heard. A male and a female. They were arguing. She recognized them both. The female one sounded just like herself, while the male one she couldn't quite place, but she knew it was familiar. Her vision then began to return slowly, first all blurry, then getting clearer. She was in a white room, laying down. It looked like a hospital room or a surgery operation room, stark bright and sterile. Lee had no idea how long she'd been out. For her it felt like seconds, but it could have been hours. She tried to get up from whatever she was lying on, but realized she was strapped down. That's when the two voices stopped arguing and went silent. Then she heard the male one say, She's awake. I can see that, the female one responded. I thought you said she'd be out for another couple hours. Maybe I misjudged the dosage. Can you blame me? Under these circumstances you've put me under. The male voice sounded nervous. Lee finally realized whom it belonged to. It was Dr. Levine. The woman with her voice was obviously Jordan. Lee began to shout, demanding to know what was going on. Jordan and Levine walked into view to her left. Jordan was still just wearing that nightgown and of course the mask, while the doctor was dressed up in his surgical getup. Look to her left. Jordan was still just wearing that nightgown and of course the mask, while the doctor was dressed up in his surgical getup, looking all prepped for an operation. Lee also noticed that Jordan was holding a gun, a small pistol, and pointing it at Levine's back. The poor, strapped-down woman was beyond bewildered. She once again demanded to know what was going on. 
Levine glanced at Jordan with a scared look while sweat ran down his forehead. With sad eyes and a melancholy voice, Jordan said, I'm sorry, sis, but I had to do it. It was my face. I had to take back my face. She then repeated it, more hysterical, her eyes growing wider behind that mask. Her face. It was her face. She was only taking back her face. What was she? Lee knew what she was talking about, but she couldn't believe it. It couldn't be. But then it all began to make sense. Ever since she'd woken up, she'd felt numb in her face. She couldn't even feel her. She tried making facial gestures, but had no idea if they were being pulled off. Jordan briefly disappeared from view and then returned with a surgical tray in her arms. She held the tray before Lee, saying, See, I'm only taking back what's mine. Lee looked at what was on the tray, and suddenly felt like passing out again. There it was, spread out on a silver tray like some rubber mask from Ruby's. Her face. Her carved out face. Jordan had a manic look in her eyes, but that was nothing compared to Lee's expression. She let out a horrified shriek and began to twist and squirm, straining against the straps of the hospital bed. Raising her head as far as she could to try and get up, Lee noticed her own reflection in a large mirror across the room. If the face on the tray wasn't proof enough, then this certainly was. What she saw in that mirror was a faceless woman. Where once there used to be a beautiful work of art made of flesh, there was now nothing but a bloodied mess. For a moment, she remained completely still mesmerized by the sight, too terrified to even comprehend what it was she was seeing. It felt like some insane fever dream, but it was real. What she was seeing wasn't fake, and upon this realization, Lee began to shriek even louder and thrash even more violently in the bed. Afraid that she might somehow get loose, Jordan handed the tray over to Dr. Levine and held her frantic sister down. Levine now finally saw his opportunity. Jordan was still holding the gun, sure, but she was too busy fidgeting with Lee to even notice him. So he did it. Without even thinking, he just wanted this macabre nightmare to end. He smashed right into Jordan's side with the tray, pushing her away from Lee and against the wall behind the bed. As she fell against the wall with a violent thud, the tray went flying across the room hitting a glass cabinet. The cabinet completely shattered, and glass shards rained down like a waterfall, mixing with the tray as it fell to the floor. Several gunshots were fired from Jordan's pistol as Levine wrestled her into submission. Luckily, if that word even fits in this story, none of the bullets hit anything but ceiling. The doctor smashed the weapon out of the crazed woman's hand, picked it up, and thus turned the tables on her. As he held Jordan at gunpoint, Levine found his phone and made the appropriate call to the police. He then unstrapped Lee. She was too groggy to stand, however, and just sat on the bed, slouched down, her face hidden behind her hands. Suddenly, as they were waiting for the law to arrive, Jordan cried out, My face! Before Levine could even react, she rushed over to the broken cabinet and began to rifle through the shards until she found the silver tray. It was turned upside down. She lifted it, and there it lay. Lee's face, the page face, shattered and torn into a thousand pieces by the glass. It was a puzzle not even the most gifted surgeon could ever put together. Jordan slumped down onto the floor like a lifeless rag doll, as if all the air had left her. Realizing it was essentially all over now, Dr. Levine sat down on the bed next to Lee, not even bothering to aim the pistol at Jordan any longer. Soon the approaching police sirens could be heard. A few months later, Jordan Page was committed to Hillbrook Insane Asylum. A couple of weeks after that, Lee Page committed suicide by drowning herself in their mansion pool. Her face never could be restored, not even by Dr. Levine himself. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to go find that Playboy centerfold of the Page girls. Maybe I'll show it to patient 876, see how she reacts.